after service from All Saints in Sidmouth. We're very happy that you joined us. Hello. Welcome to All Saints. Welcome, Welcome to, to All Saints. Saints. Hello. Hello. Welcome, Welcome to All Saints Church. <laughs> Welcome to Sunny Sidmouth. And worship at All Saints Church. Welcome to All Saints Church. Good morning and welcome to our service here at All Saints in Sidmouth. My name is David Caporn and I'm the vicar here and wherever you're joining us from it's really great to have you with us today. We're going to be continuing a series we've had in recent weeks um, uh, looking at part of Luke's Gospel and today Carol Hawkins who's one of our readers is going to be opening up for us a very deeply challenging parable uh, which Jesus tells those who are listening to him and also speaks to us profoundly today. But as we commence our time worshipping together, let's sing now praises to our God and King. Oh 
Today's reading is from Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 30. The Rich Man and Lazarus There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides, all this between us and you, a great chasm, has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, Andrea. Well, before we look at these verses, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. We pray that today he will help us to understand what you want us to learn from this reading. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Jesus was never in the market for winning friends in high places. And this story is another he told against the religious authorities. In fairness, at the time, the teaching was that if you were wealthy, God had blessed you because you were obviously righteous. But if you were poor, God had turned his back on you because you must be a great sinner. People therefore would have seen it as their right to ignore a beggar taking the attitude that his situation had come about through his own fault. And I wonder, is there still a grain of that attitude in our hearts when we see a beggar sitting on the pavement begging? Our two main characters, Lazarus and the rich man. Now, the rich man was not just comfortably off, he was obscenely wealthy. He dressed in purple and fine linen, not just on high days and holidays, but every day. Purple cloth was very expensive, and fine linen was probably the best Egyptian cotton, which still attracts a premium today. Purple and fine linen were the choice of emperors and kings. It proved their status. The rich man lived in luxury every day. He must have had the finest foods and offered the most sumptuous banquets. If you were invited, uh, well, you knew you had arrived socially. In stark contrast, at his gate laid Lazarus. He had no fine clothes, nothing to eat, hoping people would take pity on him. But the only creatures that took pity on him were the other outcasts. If you have visited the Mediterranean or the Middle East, you will have seen them roaming around in packs, the city dogs. They licked Lazarus's sores as they would lick their own in the hope of some relief. Eventually, Lazarus died and was carried off by angels, the accepted tradition for the righteous, to be close to Abraham, the father of faith, to enjoy in eternity what had been denied to him on earth. The rich man also died and was buried, no doubt in the grandest fashion. But he did not end close to Abraham. He was in Hades, in Jewish thought the place of the dead in torment where one would feel totally abandoned by God. However, somehow he could see Abraham and Lazarus far away. In life, there appeared to have been no recognition by the rich man of Lazarus, but obviously he knew him and still regarded him as only a person to serve his needs. He calls out for pity. Had he called, heard Lazarus calling out for pity? If he had, he had done nothing, but now expects Lazarus to help him. Abraham explains that there is a great gulf between them and no one can cross. Once more, the rich man expects Lazarus to do something for him, or at least for his brothers, who no doubt had exactly the same attitude to Lazarus. Warn my brothers so they won't end up here in this terrible place. Or at least the rich man shows some concern, but only for his own family. Abraham makes it clear that they have the law and the prophets everything needed to live the sort of life 
that would prevent their suffering the same end. But obviously they are not in the habit of studying or taking seriously their scriptures. But the rich man says no, surely if someone they knew had died but then returned and warned them, they would take notice. Send Lazarus and they will repent. Well, this is the first mention of repentance being the key to avoiding Hades. But the rich man does not or cannot repent of his own self-centred life. After death, is that option no longer available? Abraham is not moved. The scriptures are convincing and powerful. If you don't believe those, then you're never going to believe someone who even rises from the dead. Did the Pharisees and the teachers of the law pick up on that? Did they remember the story when they heard reports of Jesus rising from the dead? It's a powerful and perhaps slightly worrying story. What do we need to learn from it? Firstly, I think it's important to note that both the rich man and Lazarus were descendants of Abraham and therefore were part of God's chosen people. But that in itself didn't guarantee eternal salvation as clearly the rich man had ended up in Hades. In the same way, having Christian parents, growing up in a Christian home, being baptised, being confirmed, attending church, these are not the key to heaven. There is only one way to ensure acceptance by God and eternity in his love and light. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And so only by acknowledging and repenting of our own shortcomings, the Bible calls those sin, Accepting God's free gift of grace in Jesus' death on the cross in your place. And receiving his life-giving spirit, being born again. That's the way we receive eternal life. It's not that we're in church. It's that we're in Christ and Christ in us. That's the key. Secondly, God does not send anyone to hell. It's a place for unrepentant hearts, or at least for those who have heard the gospel and have rejected it. How sad that must make our gracious and generous loving God. How might we feel if someone rejects a gift from us? Lastly, the story does not teach that the rich automatically go to hell and the poor automatically go to heaven. It's not having money that's the problem. It's what we do with it we will be held accountable for. Having disposable income is a great privilege, but with it comes great responsibility. David Attenborough recently suggested that one way we could slow climate change is not to waste. Not to replace things on a whim. Items that use the earth's precious resources. He also said that ordinary people all over the world are discovering that greed does not actually lead to joy. 
I cheered the story a week ago of a school in Cornwall who thought the red noses sold by Comic Relief shouldn't be made of plastic and, encouraged by David Attenborough, pushed the charity to change. And they have. Red noses will be made from plant material next year. Wasting anything is like throwing money away. Money that could be used more helpfully. Individually or corporately, we cannot solve all the world's problems, but we do need to keep our ears and eyes open to what or who God puts in front of us and be willing to act with compassion, generosity and energy. We live in a democracy and if we see something that's wrong, we should take it up with the appropriate authorities. One of Matt Redmond's songs says, Some things must die. First and foremost, our self-centeredness. Some things must live. The Holy Spirit's influence. Not what can I gain, but what can I give? We need to be shown the way of the cross and follow it. Take it up every day. I want to finish by inviting you to watch and listen. For whom will you be encouraged to speak out, stand up, cry out, defend and lift up in Jesus' name.
Father, when our worship has been more about us than about you. Lord, have mercy. When we have ignored the pain of your broken body on earth. Christ, have mercy. When our services have been more of an escape for us than good news for the poor. Lord, have mercy. When we praise you with our lips, but deny you with our finances. Christ, have mercy. When our instruments are louder than our cries for justice. Lord, have mercy. When we fail to learn from the sacrificial worship of our brothers and sisters across the world. Christ, have mercy. May May the the Almighty Almighty and Merciful merciful Lord grant grant us pardon and forgiveness of all our sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and the strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join together in talking to our Father. Father, we thank you so much that you are our Father. This brings us peace. This brings us hope. This brings us stability. This brings us direction. This brings us purpose. This brings us life. Father, we're not exactly enjoying how things are at the moment. We're struggling with lockdown. It's not what we're used to, and it's definitely not how we want life to be. But we really want to thank you for the positive things that have come about. Thank you for the care and support people have been showing for one another. Thank you for new friendships between neighbours. Thank you for those families who have grown closer a result of, as a result of having to spend more time together. But we also bring to you those who are finding life particularly difficult. Those who are isolated even more than usual. Those whose mental health is suffering. Those who have lost their employment or businesses. Youngsters unsure of how their education is going to work out and what employment prospects they will have. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We want to pray for your church, Lord. In some ways, we just want to get back to the way things were and are fearful that that might never happen. But at the same time, we recognise that there are millions of Christians who would probably give anything to have the freedom we still have, to be able to meet on Zoom for a service or a Bible study, to be able to chat openly about you in the street or to our neighbours, even to be able to read your word freely in their own homes. Lord, help us to value and use the freedoms we have while we still have them. Help us to have the grace and the grit to carry on and help us to remember constantly our brothers and sisters who have little or no freedom at all, those for whom there simply never will be a getting back to normal. Help us to grow in our relationship with you through these times. When we can't get to church, help us to spend more time alone with you. When teaching is less accessible, help us to study your word. When we can't sing together, help us to find different ways of expressing our worship. When there are less opportunities to serve you in church, help us to see ways of serving you outside of it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, help us to see how to conduct ourselves well through this pandemic. You teach us to obey our governments and we don't want to do anything that would endanger other people's health. But we also recognise that we are in danger of allowing keeping safe 
to become the focus of our lives. Father, please help us not to allow ourselves to be controlled by fear. Help us to know what it truly means to live by faith in these times. We're becoming used to being controlled and restricted in ways we would never have imagined less than a year ago. Keep us alert and aware of other controls and restrictions slipping into our society and our laws, effectively gagging your church. Freedom of speech is already well on the way out. Freedom of religion may well be close on its heels. Help us to know when and how to make a stand for what is right, not for what is politically correct. Help us again not to be controlled by fear. In our desire to truly live for you, we take notes of the words of American theologian and author Howard Thurman. Don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and go do that because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Father, you sent your son that we might have life. In these days of restriction, control and fear, we really need you to show us what kingdom life is and how to live it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now, let's join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. And as we do, learn from Jesus' own words, his pattern for our lives. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Yes, 
And so in terms of uh, various bits of news, there's loads of information that has gone out uh, in the notice sheet that was emailed out um, over the weekend. I'd particularly like to draw your attention to our monthly prayer and praise, which is going to be taking place on Tuesday. Two op opportunities to engage with that in the church on Tuesday morning, but also um, via Zoom on Tuesday evening. If you've not signed up for that to be part of that group and receive the invite, I encourage you to do that through the church website. Uh, prayer is one of the most important things we do. Uh, and particularly this month, we're going to be praying about our work with children and young people. Covid's caused lots of challenges with that, but also various opportunities. And in many ways, there's no better time for us to come before God as a church, as we seek to pray about that work and as we share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ with those younger generations. So I encourage you to join us for that. We're going to now though conclude our service by once again singing of the challenge and the good news that the Lord Jesus brings. <laughs>
And so as we go out into the world, a final prayer. Lord, help us never to lose the normity and the good news of the kingdom. Help us to see situations and people as you do. And help us to speak words and bring actions of truth and freedom. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. I do hope you enjoyed, enjoyed the service. Thank you for joining us. Have a blessed day. Thank you for joining us today. We do hope you'll be with us again next week. Same time, same place. Bye. Thank you.